The CW Chronicles Sinners Written by Silvano Williams All content copyright 2013-2023 All rights reserved Chapter 13 The Fallen and the Oaths Vlad! What was that all about? Ilona shouted at me. I stood up wide-eyed with a rush of adrenaline in my veins. I put a hand up to my temple to calm the throbbing pain. What? I said groggily. I'm telling it how it happened. You just admitted to killing the froggy, Vlad. Ilona said, irritated. I never denied it. But how can you just say that? What you just described sounded like cold-blooded murder. I did what I did because I love you, Ilona. I saw a chance and I took it. A chance? You killed the last of its kind for a chance? At what? At your life. I wasn't going to let villain kill you. I walked up to get closer to Ilona. I did not mean to disappoint you, Ilona, but if I'm honest I would do it again, I confessed and leaned on the cell bars. You are safe from villain now, and that's all that matters to me. Oh Vlad. I shouldn't have gone after villain on my own. That was reckless. She said sounding filled with guilt. You saved CW. We both did what we felt we had to do. If these boy scouts want to carry on with the iron fist of justice, then so be it. They showed up too late. Where were they when the rescue transports were attacked? And when the commander? I tried to stop myself but it was too late. Ilona looked away from me to hide her watering eyes. I'm sorry, I said and stepped back away from the bars. I failed CW, Ilona. Villain hurt him with that chicken's blood, Vlad. Ilona answered, composing herself in what I assumed was her attempt to alleviate my guilt. I didn't want her to be strong for me to protect me. I didn't deserve it. I know. I saw that. I said softly, I felt the pain he felt. Villain's emptiness and hate shocked him. It was like acid and ice inside of him, not just with physical pain but inside his very soul. I leaned on the back wall and looked all around my cell. I can't stay locked in here, Ilona. That's what we are trying to figure out, Vlad. How do we get you out of here? After that last report, it's going to be extremely difficult. Why don't you tell me what really happened? I was tired. I was desperate. I was angry and upset. What else is there to tell? I cried out and Hammer punched the wall behind me. Ilona ignored my outburst. Tell me how you ended up there. And what happened after, you know, after villain tried to kill me? Well, now that you mention it, I am not sure of all the things that happened to me, Ilona. Go back and tell me. Where do I start? I guess where I left off after modifying the shuttle's gun seems appropriate, I muttered, and sat down on my cot. Then I closed my eyes and allowed my mind to drift into my own memories of that fateful day once again. Immediately, I recalled the feeling of dread I felt when I heard Alona's voice through CW's communicator. It made me jump into action. There was no time to waste. I got back inside what remained of my shuttle's cockpit with a simple idea. I sat down on my pilot chair, put the capacitor on my lap and buckled up. Then I hugged the cannon across my chest and pulled the eject lever on my seat. Nothing happened. I have to get down there. I yelled, exasperated, and kicked the consoles in front of me to try to pry the seat loose. That didn't work. I was angry and desperate, so without giving it a second thought, I aimed the cannon at the consoles and fired a hole into the cockpit. I did that several times, until I destroyed the entire front of the shuttle. The graying planet beckoned for me, teasing me to fall into its darkened atmosphere. Yet I remained, floating in space barely out of its gravity's grasp. Next, I pointed the cannon underneath my seat and shot off the bolts that held it to the floor. The impact and recoil from the blast pushed me away from the shuttle's remains, but not toward the planet. I stayed in orbit, 
still attached to my chair, while the rest of the rubble lazily drifted away from me further into the junkyard of metal scraps that had accumulated around the planet. I tried everything to move into the pull of the planet's gravitational field. From pelvic thrusts to firing the gun and using its recoil as momentum, all I ended up doing was spinning in place. For a few brief seconds, I could look down at the planet and reach for it, hoping its gravity would grab me by my fingertips and pull me down into it. The next moment, I'd be facing the other way looking at the burning moon, which paled the stars behind it, yet highlighted the destruction all around me. I felt like a spinning wheel of failure. I shot the gun again. It only made me spin faster in place. It got me nowhere. Just as I was about to give up hope, and all seemed to work against me, I had a moment of timelessness where I tuned out my communicator. My thoughts traveled away from it all, and into the darkness that lay beyond. It was there, that I came up with the epiphany I referenced earlier in my report. Between every radiant star, every living planet or its moons, there is never enough darkness in space. There is never enough emptiness to keep the light and hope out of sight. Life was out there. Well I am paraphrasing but whatever. The thing is that as I was about to vomit myself in my spacesuit, I saw a speck of light appear near the moon. Then with every rotation, more specks appeared. First it was five, then about ten, then a cluster so large I couldn't count them anymore. At the next turn, the specks of light were in the hundreds. With each rotation, their numbers grew exponentially. Then unexpectedly, all but one of the specks dispersed into the battlefield and toward the space armada ships. The lone speck grew brighter, shooting through the battlefield and coming closer to me. Every rotation I did on my chair was like a stop-motion animation of it coming closer and growing larger until it became a white-hot spotlight hovering over me, highlighting my shame. The light was so bright it even shone through my helmet's protective face shield. I squinted my eyes and was able to see an arm appear from within it. It reached out to me and grabbed my seat to stop it from spinning. Then the light slowly dimmed, and from within it, a silhouette of a humanoid figure appeared. It was short but stocky with what looked like a helmet of sorts. The figure began to materialize and solidify, as the light condensed onto itself. There was a stark change in contrast between the light and the figure, and the figure's details became more visible to me. I didn't have to shield my face from the light any longer and I noticed that the thing on its head I first thought was a helmet was an afro with a large headband that perked it up. The figure wore a metallic suit that sparkled the light surrounding it back in silver shimmers. Its skin was a dark bluish color. It had a robust chest but short thick arms and legs. It seemed to be male in anatomy, but its posture as it stood there looking down at me was effeminate, with a hand on its hip and the other on the chest as if clasping its heart. Who are you? I asked hesitantly, although as far as I could tell and judging from how the rest of them were destroying the space armada ships, an unknown ally had come to help us. I was a little cynical, but at the same time I felt thankful and didn't care about who they were. My only concern was finding a way to jump back into action and get down to the planet. The luminous being put its hands on its knees and bent down to stare at me. It remained silent. Push me down onto the planet. I shouted, fully expecting compliance. I shook my arms at it, but my wild flapping made me begin to rotate in place again. I ended up rotating sideways and floating upside down in front of it. The figure smiled and finally spoke. Greetings, Lieutenant Vladimir, it said. Its voice sounded male, however he over-enunciated every syllable and had too soft a tone even for his low-pitched voice. I opened my mouth to reply, but I had no friendly words for him. My nature to mock wasn't a universally understood thing, and all I wanted from him was to get me down to the planet. In any case he continued this time with a particularly flamboyant inflection, which made his voice go higher in pitch. It is a fabulous pleasure to finally meet you in person, he exclaimed. Who are you, and how do you know who I am? I asked, placing aside my urgency to get to the planet. He'd made me curious and cautiously elated. He replied with a more subdued tone. Oh, Lieutenant, we know everything about you. 
My name is Gabriel Montague, and we are the sons of Captain Weenie. The sons of CW. That caught me by surprise. Is that what the SOCW protocol was? I asked. Indeed. Gabriel replied joyfully. I took a moment to digest this when a green laser light came out of his eyes and scanned me from head to toe. I yelled at him, annoyed and suddenly feeling disoriented, What in the hell are you doing? Lieutenant Vlad, I will explain all in due time, but you have less than 15 minutes of breathable air left in your suit. I didn't care about that. I had a mission, and I'd die to complete it. We were wasting time. CW and Ilona are down there and need my help. I yelled at him. Help me get down to the planet right now, Gabriel. He grabbed my chair and pulled me up over his head. I was upside down, our foreheads about a foot apart. He looked up at me. The re-entry is going to hurt, he said. I don't care. They need me now. It is like one of the entertainers from your world once said, with love, you should go ahead and take the risk of getting hurt because love is an amazing feeling. What? Who said that? I didn't have time for ridiculous quotes. Never mind who said it. Just get me down there. As you command, Lieutenant. He said and tossed me toward the planet. We kept eye contact for a few seconds as I fell into the planet's gravitational pull. Gabriel waved goodbye at me enthusiastically, then he turned into a glowing ball of light and zoomed away in his original form to join the war against the space armada. The orbs of light were so small, they easily evaded every attack by flying around the oncoming plasma bolts. They were capable of destroying the armada by attaching themselves to the ships and overpowering their circuitry for several seconds. They zigzagged around so fast from ship to ship they looked like yellow laser beams. I was thrilled and tried to make sense of whom or what Gabriel and the sons of the captain were, but as soon as I reached the upper layers of the planet's atmosphere, they disappeared out of my view, and I was forced to put them out of my mind. Accelerating into the planet's atmosphere gave me tingles in my stomach. No, it was not tingling. It was like someone had pulled my stomach out through my throat. I concentrated on reaching Ilona to ignore it, holding on to the gun and pulling it tighter to my chest. I pushed the capacitor down against my thighs. My spacesuit lit up in flames. I gritted my teeth in pain, huffing and puffing as if that would help put it out. The seat's ejector jets came on, but it didn't feel like they helped much to decelerate my fall, although they stabilized the seat and kept it upright. I was lucky the planet had a thick but small and intensely humid atmosphere because if I had stayed up there a minute longer, I'm not sure the spacesuit would have held up. Gabriel was right. It hurt a lot. I fell through the stormy skies for a minute when the parachute automatically opened and yanked me to my senses again, allowing me to briefly appreciate my surroundings. All around me, lightning lit up the sky from within the clouds that cast shadows on the destroyed planet below. I could hear the distant booms of spacecraft exploding and thunder echoing all around the planet. It was hard to tell them apart. A screen projected from the armrest with a map of the ground area below. I could see a marker for Alona and CW's trackers in it. I could also see the crashed command center closer to the shore. From up there, I could see how the mainland had cracked in half, and how in some places the shoreline had sharp divides and sucked in the ocean water into crevasses. Lava exploded across the broken lands, and structures that looked like golden metallic skeleton fingers rose out from within the chasms. Ancient architecture protruded above the waters, as if being pushed from underneath. It made me think of ghosts waking from the dead, pulling themselves out of their graves. The storm winds and the roars of lava evaporating the waters from within them made them sound as if they were groaning. Plants and debris hung from the corroded metals like flesh on a corpse's clawed hand. The small screen caught my attention. It flashed to warn me that I needed to prepare for landing. I touched the screen right on top of CW to signal where I wanted to land, which set the small rockets on the seat on autopilot. The rockets automatically adjusted and navigated through the storm winds. The ride down was fast yet surprisingly smooth until I heard Villain speak his ultimatums. 
When I cleared the clouds, the rockets turned me toward the landing site, and that is when I saw Alona lying motionless on the ground. CW wept, defeated, about to kill the froggy, and Villain stood triumphantly with Alona's head under his boot. I raised the gun and aimed it at Villain's head, but just as I was about to shoot he said, Kill it. If it dies, I promise you, I will allow her to live. Quite honestly, time stopped for me. I had a million thoughts but only one conclusion. I would do anything to secure Ilona's well-being. I looked down the barrel of my cannon. My HUD's targeting zeroed in on the froggy's small head. All I saw was a pitiful being covered in mud, who not only asked to be killed, but was a second away from being destroyed by CW's beanie anyway. So, I took my shot. I wish I could be more sensitive about it, but that was all there was to it. My instinct was to kill it, and I did it without hesitation. Can I justify it now and tell you that it looked like it was dead already, like the Space Armada pilots, and that I thought for a second that Villain was tricking CW with a zombie froggy? That if I hadn't, Villain or even CW would have killed it anyway. I can say these things to save my own ass, and they could potentially be true. Nevertheless, I will admit that the only reason I shot and killed the froggy was Villain had promised CW he would let Ilona live if it died, and I took the chance his word would bind him to that, just like CW's did. Hell, maybe I had misunderstood Villain and had made a horrible mistake. I don't feel remorse for what I did though. So no, there are no maybes. I did what I had to do, because I would have rather died in shame than live without Ilona. I put my love for her, above my own morality. Emotion got the best of me. It always did. That fateful moment was no exception. Anger overtook me, so I yelled out to Villain for no other reason than to let him know I had done it. I wanted to rub it in his face. Honor your word, scumbag, I cried out to him when he looked up and we made eye contact. Then I shot him in the chest and thought we had won at last. I thought I had finally killed Villain. Apparently, I was wrong. Villain absorbed the blast from my cannon and that time he didn't feel any pain. Whatever had weakened him before, which I assumed was the disgusting chicken blood, its effects had worn out. He flinched but was not hurt and as soon as he realized it, he jumped up into the air and perched himself on my parachute chair. I tried to shoot him when I saw him jump at me, but he had already crushed the gun with his left hand and slapped the capacitor from my lap halfway across the world with his right knobby fist before he even landed on top of me. Villain grabbed me by the back of my helmet and pulled me out of the chair with such force, he broke both of my clavicles and dislocated my shoulders with the safety belts. He then threw me from up there. I landed with a sloppy flap on the muddy ground below. I did not feel any immediate pain, and remained conscious for the most part. At least my mind was there, but that's when things got weird for me. I remember trying to dance. At the time as far as I knew, I was dancing my heart out like Sam Rockwell preparing for a movie, but Villain decided to be a party pooper. He ripped off my helmet and grabbed me by the throat. You don't get a speech. He roared at me and squeezed. My eyes rolled back, and I felt them expand outward due to the pressure Villain was causing to my head. I remember trying to breathe, but it was as if I didn't have the muscles to do it. My dance floor turned into a reflection of darkness. Then I spoke, or rather, something spoke through me. Your, Your destiny, destiny is broken. broken. The sound of two disembodied voices echoed around me harmoniously, with a power that quieted even Villain's loudest scream. They weren't coming out of my mouth. It was as if the voices emanated from the air around us, and from inside of me. Villain heard it too, and he replied, I have made my own destiny, Earth scum. The, the battle, battle between, between chaos, chaos and order, order in your, your dimension, dimension serves no purpose. purpose. There, there will, will never, never be balance. balance. I don't need balance. I have power. Your, your power, power has peaked. You, you will, will never achieve your final evolution. The destiny of a champion is to create life in its own image, and you have been denied this. Creation will never be yours. 
I felt villain's anger, his voice growled loudly even in my ether world. My destiny is destruction. Fires burned within my eyes. I saw it as if I were standing above myself and away from villain's grip. Villain stared into them, and I saw the blue and red flames that reflected from his one blood-colored goggle lens. Inside the red flame, there was an image of villain walking through a realm that looked like a shadow version of Earth. Darkness and palpable solitude, pain and feelings of regret surrounded him. He marched through it, unaffected with the intent of capturing the mysterious headless bleeding running chicken. This was a past memory, and I think this was hell. He had successfully captured it there. In the blue flames, I saw CW's melted face crying. He reached out but fell away from me. I heard him asking for my forgiveness, but then the booming voices spoke again. This, this one does, does not belong, belong to your dimension. dimension. He, he is, is not, not for you to destroy. destroy. As, As you came, came into our realm and took from us, now so shall we. We take from you the power to destroy our son, for he was created in our image and serves only our purpose. Villain tightened his grip on me. He even brought up his misshapen hand to my throat. His muscles bulged to the point of him feeling the pressure of his exertion and pain all over his body again. I will take everything from you, Weenie. Villain shouted, trying to squeeze me to death as he spoke to CW. Everything. He repeated, finally realizing he could not kill me, so he tossed me to the side. My limp body landed on the slushy ground, which again didn't provide any cushion at all. This is my dimension. My power. My destiny. Villain yelled to the sky. The cosmos will tremble, and all will pay for your intrusion, cherubs. Villain then savagely turned his attention to Ilona, and pushed his boot down on her head. However, he couldn't kill her either. His leg would not push hard enough to harm her. When he tried to force it, a sharp pain ran up his disabled right hand, which made his knees buckle. CW moaned at the same time. Villain realized he was now bound by his promise. Sensing defeat, Villain grabbed CW by the hair with his left hand and pulled him up to his own hooded face. She lives, so I've honored your request, Weenie. He growled. I am forced to keep my oath, but so are you. From now on, you will do nothing to stop me. CW's eyes opened wide and his melted face drooped in shock. I can't. Stop you. He whispered, his voice blank of emotion. I surrendered hope. Villain released CW and grabbed the beanie from the ground. He then jumped into his ship. With this beanie, I will be the new symbol of hope, Weenie. Villain said as he made to fly his ship away, but hundreds of the bright yellow orbs had zoomed down and now held his fighter in place. They overpowered his fighter's circuits with an energy spike, partially disabling it and making it sputter back to the ground. Villain jumped out of the cockpit and landed on the back of his failing ship. He quickly swatted down and grabbed a couple of the yellow specks of light. He then crushed them with his hand, extinguishing their light with a loud pop and turning them to ash. Villain shook his hand to clean it from the remnants, annoyed at the unworthy beings that fell under his strength. The ashy remains were carried away to the great beyond by the stormy winds, mixed with the rest of the planet's fiery destruction. Villain tried to grab more, but the other orbs hastily dispersed out of his reach. He then looked away into the distance at something unseen by any of us. Villain saw the mysterious, headless, bleeding, running chicken being blown out of the planet's atmosphere by the steam of a volcanic geyser. The chicken wildly flailed its featherless body, somehow propelled unnaturally fast from the planet's gravity and past the rubbish and dead bodies in orbit. I must find that chicken again. Villain growled and jumped into the air, disappearing into the storm clouds above. He used the raindrops as steps to chase after the chicken. They both disappeared into the darkness of space. After a few minutes I woke up briefly and had a fit of coughing. I spit mud from inside my mouth. DP officers surrounded us. One of them leaned down and spoke to me. He had a familiar voice and that green scanning light thing. Greetings again. Lieutenant Vladimir. 
he said with his soft voice. You are lucky you aren't dead. Pain made the world blurry and words hard to comprehend. I groaned and buried my face back in the mud as unconsciousness took me.